Valentine's Day, February 14th, is a holiday that celebrates love and friendship in the United States. Most people think of it as a romantic day to show the one you love how much you care by purchasing cards and gifts. Valentine's Day is also an extremely commercial holiday. People spend money on flowers, balloons, chocolate, stuffed animals, and jewelry. People also go out for expensive dinners. Valentine's Day is even celebrated by school children who give thank you cards to their teachers. Some high schools have Valentine's Day dances. Classmates give each other little cards. These cards can be purchased at any store with famous cartoon characters. It is considered much more thoughtful to have kids make handmade cards to give to friends and teachers. Valentine's Day is also a great day to announce your love to someone like a secret crush. Some people even get married on Valentine's Day. However, you don't have to be in love to share in the festivities. You can say Happy Valentine's Day to friends and co-workers. Valentine's Day is not an official holiday, though in the U.S., meaning government offices and schools are open as usual. The date used to be the celebration of a saint named Valentine, who allegedly saved a young girl's life. It wasn't until the Middle Ages that romance somehow got mixed in with the date, and the lovers would send each other handwritten love notes. Back then, you couldn't just go to the store and buy a card the way you can now. You know Valentine's Day is around the corner when stores begin to decorate with red and pink hearts and the symbol of Cupid. A winged, ancient Roman god said to strike the hearts of people with his arrow. Now it seems Cupid goes straight after your wallet because you will also see many more jewelry ads as Valentine's Day approaches. St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, is a Christian religious holiday that celebrates the patron saint of Ireland. According to the legend, St. Patrick drove all the snakes out of Ireland. St. Patrick's Day has also become, especially in the United States, a day to celebrate Irish culture. In major cities across the country, like in New York and Boston, there are parades and festivals. People wear green and decorate with shamrocks, a type of three-leaf clover. Some people wear buttons or t-shirts that say, Kiss me, I'm Irish. In the U.S., St. Patrick's Day is not a legal holiday, meaning government offices and schools are open. The biggest and oldest parade takes place in New York City. It actually began about 250 years ago before the U.S. was even its own country. Every year, thousands gather along to watch hundreds of Irish step dancers and bagpipe players march. Irish step dancing is done in groups or solo. Dancers perform complicated moves with their feet and legs while keeping their upper bodies stiff. The parade has also been a source of controversy because the parade is associated with the Catholic Church in New York City. Gay and lesbian organizations have not been allowed to march. Many people protest the parade or boycott it. St. Patrick's Day has also become associated with the drinking of a lot of alcohol, specifically beer. One drink that is often seen around the holiday is green beer. This is really just regular beer with green food coloring. Many people feel like the holiday celebrates stereotypes about the Irish, like the myth that they all like to drink and get drunk. Others complain that the holiday has become too focused on drinking, with public drunkenness as a problem in major cities around the holiday. Easter is a Christian holiday that celebrates the resurrection of the dead of Jesus Christ as told in the Bible. Christians are found in church on Easter. Some Christians participate in an Easter vigil or nighttime mass, sometimes held by candlelight. Easter is never on a set date. It is observed on a Sunday between the end of March and the end of April. The exact date is calculated based on a different calendar. Many public schools in the U.S. have a week-long vacation around Easter time. Sometimes this break is called Easter or Spring Break, in the United States, Easter is also celebrated as a secular holiday. It is associated with the beginning of spring and symbolized by bunnies, flowers, and dyed eggs. Many children in the U.S. believe in a fictional character called the Easter Bunny. According to the myth, the Easter Bunny leaves baskets full of candy for children. Sometimes these baskets are hidden, and the children have to find them on Easter Sunday morning. Candy that is usually inside an Easter basket can include chocolate in the shape of bunnies or chicks, jelly beans, and marshmallows. Another activity associated with Easter is an Easter egg hunt. 
According to popular mythology, the Easter Bunny hides painted eggs and children need to find them. While real eggs used to be used, now it is common to use plastic eggs filled with candy. There are usually public Easter egg hunts in parks across the country. The White House even hosts an Easter egg hunt. Another Easter tradition associated with Easter is dyeing real eggs in different, usually pastel, colors like light pink, blue, and yellow. In New York City, people take to Fifth Avenue to participate in the Easter Parade. The Easter Parade isn't a parade with marching bands and floats. People walk up and down Fifth Avenue showing off elaborately decorated hats or Easter bonnets. Mother's Day is a holiday that celebrates and honors mothers in the United States. It is celebrated on the second Sunday in May. It became an official holiday in the country at the start of the 20th century as a way to honor mothers whose sons had died in war. The holiday is celebrated in a number of ways. People give mothers gifts like flowers, cards, and jewelry to thank them for all their hard work. A popular symbol of the holiday is the carnation. This is because when the holiday first began in the U.S., people were encouraged to wear a red carnation if their mother was alive or a white carnation if their mother was dead. Many people take their mothers out for a special meal. In fact, Mother's Day is the most popular date in the U.S. for people to go out and eat, and it is estimated that people spend billions on meals and gifts. Mother's Day is also the most popular day to make long-distance calls in the U.S., it is the second most popular gift-giving day after Christmas. Since its establishment, Mother's Day has been criticized for becoming highly commercialized. In fact, the founder of the U.S. holiday, Anna Jarvis, began protesting the holiday and was even arrested for disturbing the peace for demonstrating. Jarvis's own mother started the campaign to establish a mother's holiday during the American Civil War. Mothers are not the only people celebrated on this day. All mother figures, including grandmothers, great-grandmothers, stepmothers, and foster mothers, are honored on the holiday. In schools, many students make special gifts, including handmade cards. While widely recognized, Mother's Day is not a federal holiday. Many other countries around the world have their own version of Mother's Day. Father's Day is a holiday observed in the United States to honor fathers, fatherhood, and other paternal figures like grandfathers, stepfathers, and uncles. It is observed on the third Sunday in June. In the early 20th century, there was a mining accident in West Virginia that killed almost 400 men. A push for a day to remember the men killed, who were mostly husbands and fathers, was the start of a push for a national holiday. This was in 1908. It wasn't until 1972, however, that Father's Day was recognized by law as a national holiday. This is due in part to the fact that people were resistant to what they saw as another overly invented holiday meant to just make people spend money. It wasn't seen as a way to remember the dead or to honor living fathers and father figures. People weren't entirely wrong. Organizations representing men's clothing manufacturers put in a lot of money for the holiday to become popular. Like Mother's Day, it indeed is a holiday that has become highly commercialized. There are greeting cards to mark the day, and stores advertise gifts for dad. These gifts traditionally include electronics, ties, and tools. In schools, children often make cards and other gifts, Father's Day is not a federal holiday, even though it is widely celebrated. Some of the ways Father's Day is celebrated is with meals, especially barbecues since the holiday falls at the beginning of the summer. Memorial Day is a United States holiday to remember the men and women who have died while serving in the armed forces. The armed forces include all branches of the U.S. military. Those branches are Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, and Coast Guard. Memorial Day is a federal holiday, which means government offices, banks, post offices, and schools are closed. Memorial Day is always observed on the last Monday of May. Memorial Day has its roots in the U.S. Civil War, when a holiday, Decoration Day, was established to honor both Union and Confederate soldiers who died. 
On Decoration Day, people used to decorate the graves of deceased soldiers with flags and flowers. The name Memorial Day became more widely used after World War II in the late 1940s. However, the holiday wasn't officially called Memorial Day until 1967. Memorial Day is commemorated by ceremonies in cemeteries across the country. The most well-known one is held in Arlington National Cemetery near Washington, D.C. Arlington is a military cemetery, meaning only military personnel are buried there. Volunteers place U.S. flags on military graves at Arlington and other national cemeteries. There are also parades in honor of fallen service people held in different towns and cities. Another Memorial Day tradition is flying the U.S. flag at half-staff until noon, meaning it is flown at half its normal height. This is considered a sign of mourning. The flag is raised to its full height after noon as a sign that the military will rise up despite the loss. There is also a National Memorial Day concert that takes place on the lawn of the U.S. Capitol. Memorial Day is also known as the unofficial start of the summer season. Many beaches and pools open up for Memorial Day weekend. Many people also host barbecues on Memorial Day weekend. Labor Day is observed on the first Monday of September. It is a holiday meant to honor the contributions, both economic and social, of U.S. workers. It has been an official federal holiday since 1894, meaning that government offices, including post offices and schools, are closed. It is also widely thought that Labor Day was created as an alternative holiday to May Day. May Day, especially in the 1800s, had become a protest day when workers marched to demand better rights and working conditions. There were often strikes that ended in violence. At the time, the U.S. government was afraid that May Day was being led by communists and was having a bad influence on workers. Some people feel September was also chosen since there are no other holidays between Fourth of July and Thanksgiving in November. On Labor Day, there are usually parades in major cities around the country. Politicians and labor leaders make speeches and hold press conferences. Labor Day is also considered the unofficial end of summer. Many people celebrate Labor Day with trips to the beaches, picnics, and barbecues. Many towns and cities host fireworks on this day. Many people also take their last summer vacations around this time. Labor Day is also the beginning of the professional and college football season in the U.S. Labor Day has also become an important retail holiday. Many stores have Labor Day sales to coincide with the start of the school year for many children in the U.S. This means that many store workers, while their holiday is being celebrated, have to work long hours. Columbus Day is observed on the second Monday of October in the United States and in some other countries around the world. For a long time, it was observed on a specific date, October 12th. It is named after Christopher Columbus, the Italian sailor who led three Spanish ships to claim new lands in 1492. There is even a child's poem remembering the date. It reads, In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Some people say Columbus discovered North America, although not everyone agrees with this interpretation. For example, Columbus never landed on North America proper. He only got as far as to the islands in the Caribbean Sea. Columbus Day has been a federal holiday since 1937. Government offices, schools, and post offices are closed. Many Italians take the day as a day to celebrate their own ethnic heritage since Columbus was born in Genoa, Italy. Columbus's explorations, however, were conducted in the name of Spain. Major cities like New York City and San Francisco host large parades. Some cities like New York City also hold a parade celebrating the Hispanic or Latino community. Not everyone thinks Christopher Columbus should be honored. Some states like South Dakota do not observe the holiday at all. Instead, they call the day Native American Day or Indigenous Peoples Day. In Hawaii, the holiday is also known as Landing Day or Discoverer's Day. This is because European arrival in North America meant the loss of land and lives for many Native people. Many people hold protests or vigils on this day to remember the Native Americans that were killed 
or enslaved as a result of the European arrival. Another name for the holiday is Dia de la Raza, which translates into English as Day of the Race. Halloween is on October 31st. It is also called All Hallows' Eve or All Saints' Eve. This is because, according to some, the holiday has its roots in a Christian holiday that remembers the dead. Others say the holiday has its roots in the ancient harvest season traditions of Ireland. In the U.S., though, the focus is less on memories of the dearly departed or agriculture. It is about kids dressing up in scary costumes and going door to door asking for candy. This is called trick-or-treating. When children knock on the door of a house or ring the doorbell, they usually say trick-or-treat. The trick part is a fake threat, signaling that the kids will commit a prank if they aren't given something delicious. Homeowners then give the children candy, raisins, or some other food treat. Many homeowners decorate their houses to prepare for the holiday and let kids know that they are participating and can ring the bell for candy. Traditional decorations often include jack-o'-lanterns, which are pumpkins with faces carved into them and candles inside. Jack-o'-lanterns were thought to scare away evil spirits when Halloween was first celebrated among the ancient Christians. Also, turnips, not pumpkins, were originally used. People often decorate using the colors black and orange. Halloween is not just for kids. Adults get in on the fun by attending costume parties. There are often contests for who has the best costume. There are also games bobbing for apples where people have to get an apple using only their teeth from a large bucket of water. Other people celebrate by scaring themselves by going to haunted houses, homes where people dressed up as ghosts, zombies, and werewolves and jump out to frighten guests. People also tell scary stories or watch horror movies. Taxes are special fees charged by a government on the people who live in a country, state, or city. These fees help pay for public services like police, road and bridge repair, and public schools. In the United States, people have to pay national, state, and local taxes. Income tax is a tax applied to how much money a person earns in a year. There are both federal and state income taxes. These have to be paid every year by April 15th. There are special forms the Internal Revenue Service, IRS, the government agency in charge of collecting taxes, asks people to fill out. There are tax credits that people with low income, college students, and parents can get. These credits could mean actually getting money back from the government. This money is called a tax refund. People can get both a federal and state tax refund. Anyone who works has to be taxed regardless of the immigration status. Not paying income taxes could mean a fine or even jail time. Payroll taxes are taxes that are taken right out of a person's paycheck. There are federal and state payroll taxes. These include Social Security and Medicare taxes. Social Security taxes pay for the retirement and disability benefits received by millions of Americans each year. Medicare taxes pay for the federal health insurance program that covers the elderly and the disabled. People who own houses pay property taxes. The amount paid depends on how much the property is worth. This tax is usually paid once a year. Sales tax is a tax almost everyone pays. Sales tax is a specific extra percentage charged on nearly all purchases. Everything from soap to furniture has a sales tax attached when bought. The amount of the sales tax is different across states and cities. Health insurance is one way to pay for health care. Health care includes visits to the doctor, prescription medication, and emergency services. People can pay for medicine and doctor visits directly in cash, or they can use health insurance. Health insurance usually means you pay less for these services. There are different types of health insurance. At some jobs, companies offer health insurance plans as part of a benefits package. Individuals can also buy health insurance. The elderly and disabled can get government-run health insurance through programs like Medicaid and Medicare. There are many different health insurance companies or plans. Each health plan has a set of doctors they work with. Once a person picks a plan, they pay a premium, which is a fixed amount of money every month. Once in a plan, a person picks a doctor they want to see from that plan. That doctor 
is the person's primary care provider. Obamacare, or the Affordable Care Act, is a recently passed law that makes it easier for people to get health insurance. The law requires all Americans have health insurance by 2014. Those that do not get health insurance by the end of the year will have to pay a fine in the form of an extra tax when they file their income taxes. Through Obamacare, people can still get insurance through their jobs, privately, or through Medicaid and Medicare. They can also buy health insurance through state marketplaces, where people can get help choosing a plan based on their income and health care needs. These marketplaces also create an easy way to compare what different plans offer. If people cannot afford to buy health insurance, they may qualify for government programs that offer free health insurance like Medicaid, Medicare, or for children, a special program called the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP. Most children in the U.S. begin school at age 5 when they go to kindergarten. This is the beginning of elementary or primary school. Most children stay in elementary schools till they are about 11 years old. Elementary schools are divided by grades. The youngest children begin in kindergarten at 5 and then go to first grade, second grade, and so on. Most elementary schools go up to fifth or sixth grade. The focus of an elementary school is basic academic and socialization skills. Mostly, children learn how to read, write, count, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Students also learn the rules of English grammar, spelling, and vocabulary. Children also learn basic social studies or history, science, art, and music skills and participate in gym or physical education. In elementary schools, children also learn how to follow directions, share, and work in groups. Students usually stay in one classroom all day with one teacher who stays with them throughout the year. Students may leave the classroom to visit the school library, the school gym, and attend special science, art, and music classes. Students also usually leave the classroom for lunch and recess. For lunch, students sit at tables separated by a grade in a large cafeteria. Recess is usually a half hour when children go out into a yard to play. The typical school day starts at about 8 o'clock in the morning and ends at about 3 o'clock p.m., Students go to school from Monday to Friday and have the weekends off. Elementary school teachers are licensed by the state where they work. They have to graduate from college or even graduate school taking special classes in early childhood and elementary education. Before teachers can be in a classroom with students, they have to pass a background check and take an exam. Once a child finishes fifth or sixth grade in elementary school, they graduate and go on to middle school or junior high school. This school is a separate building or set of buildings. Most students in middle school are between the ages of 10 and 14. The grade system continues in middle school. Middle school usually starts with 6th or 7th grade and ends with 8th grade. While they are less common, some elementary schools go from kindergarten to 8th grade. Most students are assigned a middle school based on where they live. However, there are charter, private, and specialized public middle schools that have an application process. The purpose of middle school is to provide a transition period between elementary school and high school. Middle school prepares students for high school life. In middle school, students don't stay in one classroom all day with one teacher. Students change classrooms for different subjects and have different teachers for each subject, in middle school, some students may even be able to choose some of their own classes, called electives. There is a set of core classes that all students have to take. These include English, Math, Science and Social Studies or History classes. Gym or Physical Education classes are also required. A common feature of middle school is a homeroom, which is a classroom students visit at a scheduled time once a day or once a week. A homeroom teacher takes attendance and makes announcements of things students need to know. The homeroom also helps students feel like there is one common place and one common teacher they see regularly. This is to help with the transition from elementary school to secondary school. Once a student finishes middle school, they have a graduation ceremony and go to a high school assigned to them or a high school they picked.
Public schools are available for kids from kindergarten through 12th grade, free of charge. However, many families choose to pay for their children's primary and secondary education by sending them to private schools. There are many different types of private schools and many different reasons why parents send their kids there. Some private schools are military type, and yet others are boarding schools where students live on campus. Some private schools are affiliated with a certain religion. These schools teach a specific faith's beliefs and traditions, as well as the regular academic subjects. There are schools run by Catholics, Protestants, Jewish people, Muslims, and Orthodox Christians. There are also private schools that specialize in teaching disabled students. Some parents choose private schools because they feel that they offer a better education than public schools. Others choose private schools because they offer a different type of curriculum. Waldorf schools, for example, only let children play and use items made of natural materials. Private schools are also called independent schools or non-state schools because they are not run by local, state, or national governments. They can pick what students to go to their schools. They do this through admission examinations and interviews. There is often an admissions application. Some private schools accept anyone who can pay tuition to send their children there. Some schools charge up to $45,000 a year. Private schools charge tuition because they do not get any money collected from local, state, and national taxes. Some private schools offer a limited number of scholarships to help pay for school. Many of these scholarships are need-based, meaning for students who can't afford the tuition. Other scholarships are offered for students with very good grades or for students that have a talent in a sport or art. California is the largest state in the United States of America. It is home to more than 10% of the country's total population. It also has the largest education system in the country. The college and university system is divided into four parts. Those parts are the University of California system, the California State University system, the community college system, and private institutions. The UC system has more than 230,000 students at its 10 campuses. It is considered the more prestigious system in the state. It includes top universities like UC Berkeley and the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Both schools rank in the top 25 universities in the country, with Berkeley in the top 10. A degree from the UC system is highly sought, and the academic standards are higher than the other systems. They are also more expensive. The California State Universities counts 23 universities in its system. It is a diversified system that includes two polytechnic universities and a maritime university. These schools offer vocational and maritime education, but also offer traditional academic programs. The system's enrollment is approximately 450,000 students with about 45,000 faculty members. The California Community Colleges system is the largest systems of higher education in the state and the world. It boasts 112 campuses and serves approximately 2.4 million students. It offers transfer degrees, vocational training, and associate's degree programs. California is also home to a large number of privately owned and operated schools. These schools have no ties to the state school system, but some do accept transfer students from community colleges. The most notable and prestigious schools in the state are Stanford University in Palo Alto and the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. It is very common to see homeless people on the streets of Los Angeles. This is a problem that has persisted in the city since the beginning of the 20th century. Back in that time, California was known for offering many job opportunities in farming, and many young men were hopping on trains from all over the country to arrive in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, many of those men often ended up finding themselves without a job, a place to stay, or even food to eat. To help these people, many churches began to establish shelters in the area of Los Angeles that would eventually become downtown. Even as the farm landscape changed to a big city environment, these shelters remained a refuge for many individuals that found themselves homeless. 
Nowadays, the homeless population of Los Angeles is made up of much more than just young men looking for work. Many economic and social changes have resulted in both men and women of all ages turning to the streets of Los Angeles. Some of them are there as a result of substance abuse that has left them moneyless and jobless. Others are veterans from various wars that cannot find the resources to get back to their normal lives. Additionally, many of these people suffer from mental disabilities that limit them from finding a job or being accepted in the rest of society. Since there are a lot of different causes that lead to homelessness, it is easy to see why finding solutions to helping all of the homeless people is so difficult. Although there are many programs that focus on providing the homeless food daily, it is much harder to find programs that try to assist the homeless in finding jobs and stable housing. In order to finally find a solution that will effectively help decrease the number of homeless people in the city, a lot more individualized attention must be placed on individuals based on their physical and mental health and circumstance. Some of the everyday heroes in the United States are the country's paramedics. These young men and women are usually the first people who respond to medical emergencies suffered by citizens. Paramedics must complete a very extensive physical training program that is designed to weed out those who cannot make the cut. A paramedic must be in fit condition and be mentally strong to perform his or her duties in the face of danger. Many of these heroes must endure life-threatening situations when responding to emergencies. Paramedics are usually attached to a county or city fire department, but there are also some private paramedic organizations. In Southern California, there are two primary schools for paramedic training. They are UCLA's Daniel Freeman Paramedic Program and the Paramedic Training Institute. Both of these schools provide candidates for the Los Angeles County and City Fire Departments. To become a paramedic for a county or city organization, candidates must also pass a psychological screening and a physical training program. Some of the equipment paramedics carry is very specialized. They carry basic and advanced life support gear, such as forcible entry tools, so they can reach people in peril, saws to cut through obstacles, and other emergency equipment. Paramedics provide a valuable service to the communities they serve. They must be certified in cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, techniques, and be trained to handle all situations. Some paramedics are trained to respond to what is called mass casualty incidents, MCI. These emergencies occur whenever there is a tragic event such as the September 11th, 2001 attacks on the country and other emergencies like earthquakes, mudslides, or floods. Paramedics can also be sent to emergency situations by citizens who call the 911 emergency phone number. On one of New York City's most famous avenues, Fifth Avenue is Museum Miley. Museum Mile is a 23-block stretch that holds some of the most famous museums in the world. Museum Mile begins at 85th Street and 5th Avenue with the massive Metropolitan Museum of Art. Inside is thousands of years' worth of art and artifacts. A visitor can visit an entire Egyptian tomb, sit in a Japanese-style garden, view Renaissance paintings and ancient Greek and Roman sculptures. There is even a gallery featuring musical instruments. In the summer, there is a rooftop garden where there are spectacular views of the city, especially of Central Park. The Guggenheim on 88th Street and 5th Avenue looks a little bit like a snail's shell from the outside. When it opened in the 1950s, the swirling architecture, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, was thought to be ugly by many. This museum focuses on modern art, but sometimes features special exhibits like one they had a few years ago of ancient Mexican ruins. The National Academy Museum and School of Fine Arts on 91st Street and 5th Avenue is the city's oldest art school, dating back to 1825. The Jewish Museum on 93rd Street and 5th Avenue tells 4,000 years worth of Jewish history. Up 10 blocks on 103rd Street and 5th Avenue, is the Museum of the City of New York, showcasing the history of the Big Apple from its colonial start. 
One block up on 104th Street and 5th Avenue is El Museo del Barrio. This museum started as a space to reflect the city's large Puerto Rican migrant community. Now it features exhibits focusing on art from all over Latin America. Across the avenue is the Central Park Conservatory Garden with a fountain that has a sculpture of three dancing life-size women. The Empire State Building may be the most famous building in New York City. It is called the Empire State Building because New York State is called the Empire State. It is 1,454 feet tall. Many people think it is the tallest building in the world. This was true when it was built in 1931. In 1970, when the World Trade Center was built, that became the tallest building. Now, the Empire State Building is the fourth tallest building in the U.S. and the 23rd tallest in the world. Inside the building is mostly occupied by offices and stores. People can go to the top of the building, where there is an observation deck. From the top, there are beautiful views of New York City, especially at night. Most people take one of 73 elevators to the top. It takes less than one minute by elevator to get to the 80th floor. That is where there is a gift shop. Some people walk 1860 steps to the top. Every year, there is even a race, with people competing to see who can walk up to the top the fastest. The landmark is not just famous because of its height. In 1945, a small plane crashed into it. More than 30 people have tried to kill themselves by jumping off the building. In 1933, it was featured in the movie King Kong, where a giant gorilla climbs to the top and falls to his death after being attacked by airplanes. The building was also in the movie Sleepless in Seattle with Tom Hanks. At night, the top of the Empire State Building is lit up in different colors. It is red and green on Christmas, red for Lunar New Year, and blue for Hanukkah. On the 4th of July, it is red, white, and blue. For many years, gambling in the United States was legal only in the state of Nevada. Nevada is a western state that is east of California, south of Oregon and Idaho, west of Utah, and north of Arizona. It is a desert state where little rain falls during the year. It's a little more than 275 miles from the city of Los Angeles, which is where most of its visitors come from. Driving from Los Angeles is about four hours. Las Vegas, which means the meadows in Spanish, was established by the Mexicans in the mid-1800s. Much of what is now the southwestern part of the United States was then part of the Mexican Empire. The city was a railroad town established in 1905, and the first legal casino appeared in 1931. Las Vegas is now a gambling town where people from all over the United States come to vacation. Its population is under 2 million, making it the 30th largest city in the country. Its original population in 1905 was only 5,000. Much of the city's growth is due to the gambling industry. Many states have since legalized gambling, including New Jersey and California. But Las Vegas remains the number one tourist city for gamblers in the U.S., Today, some of its largest and most beautiful hotels include Bellagio, Flamingo, Cesar's Palace, Treasure Island, Mandalay Bay, and Wynn. These hotels are on Las Vegas Boulevard, which is commonly called The Strip. With its nearly year-round sunshine, beautiful casinos, and variety of gaming options, Las Vegas remains the best location for gambling in the U.S. On December 7, 1941, the United States of America was attacked by the Imperial Japanese Navy at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The surprise attack was intended to destroy the American Pacific Fleet that stood in the way of Japan's complete domination of the Pacific Ocean during the 1940s. The attack was coordinated with attacks in the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Pearl Harbor was attacked by more than 350 Japanese airplane fighters, bombers, and torpedo planes that were launched from six aircraft carriers. The early morning attack sank four U.S. battleships, and four more were heavily damaged. 
six of the eight battleships were restored and returned to service, but the Japanese also destroyed or damaged three cruisers, three destroyers, a mine layer, and an anti-aircraft training ship. In addition, 188 U.S. aircraft were destroyed, with many of them on the ground. The attack was devastating. It took the U.S. years to recover from all the damage caused on that fateful morning. However, the Japanese were unable to destroy their main targets, the Navy's aircraft carriers. By what some call a stroke of luck, the U.S. carrier fleet was out to sea at the time of the attack. The country was in shock at the news of the disaster. U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt called the attack cowardly and declared December 7th as a day that will live in infamy. On December 8th, the United States formally declared war on Japan. This plummeted the country into World War II, which Roosevelt had long hoped to avoid. Soon after the United States' declaration of war against Japan, Germany, which was a Japanese ally, declared war on the U.S., and the country was now fully involved in the greatest war in the history of the world. Chicago is known as the Windy City. Some people think this is because of the breeze that blows almost constantly. The city is located in the state of Illinois, on the shore of one of the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, which is the fifth largest freshwater body in the world. Chicago may also be called the Windy City because of the wind tunnel effect created in downtown by many tall buildings. Skyscrapers are an important part of Chicago's history. The first skyscraper in the U.S. was built in the city in 1884. At only 10 stories, it was impressive for its time. The skyscraper was eventually demolished. Um, Chicago is the home of other famous firsts. It was the birthplace of the refrigerated rail car, mail order catalogs, the car radio, the TV remote control, the first Ferris wheel, the first steel railroad, the first planetarium in the Western Hemisphere, Chicago is also the home to the first blood bank and the first drive-in bank. It is also the home to the Lincoln Park Zoo, the oldest public zoo in the U.S. Uh, maybe the Windy City should be called the City of Firsts. Chicago is the third most populous city in the U.S. after New York City and Los Angeles. A little more than two and a half million people live in the city that has more than 100 neighborhoods. President Barack Obama used to live in Chicago. Nearly 40 million people visit Chicago every year. Many of them visit the Willis Tower. Formerly known as the Sears Tower, it is the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. It takes only a minute to get up to the 103rd floor sky deck thanks to some of the fastest elevators in the world. From the sky deck, visitors can see four states, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Boston is the capital of Massachusetts. It is the largest city in the New England state and is rich with history. This is why over 12 million people visit the city every year. It is a very old city founded in 1630 by English colonists fleeing religious persecution. The American Revolution, when colonists, known as patriots, fought for their independence from the British, began in Boston with the Battle of Lexington. Other key events in the revolution occurred in the city. One was the Boston Massacre, when British troops fired upon protesters, killing five. The Boston Tea Party, when colonists dumped an entire shipment of British tea into the harbor to protest taxes, was not a party at all. Paul Revere's Midnight Ride, where he warned colonists of British troops approaching, also happened in Boston. Many of these sites can be accessed by taking a walk down the Freedom Trail, a red line of bricks embedded in the ground through the city. Boston is also a city of notable firsts. America's first public school was founded in Boston in 1635. Boston Common, where British troops camped during the American Revolution and where early colonists hanged people, is the oldest public park in the United States. Boston is also home to the oldest subway system in the United States. Like many cities in the United States, immigrants played a large role in its development. Irish immigrants who settled in Boston, for example, played a large role in both local and national politics. 
Boston also has a large and active Puerto Rican community and Italian community. President John F. Kennedy and his family have ties to Boston. Boston is also well known for many colleges and universities that surround it. Some of the most famous are Harvard and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Boston attracts more than 350,000 college students from around the world. The United States is a country that has people from all over the world. Not only do many people speak different languages, many people practice different religions. Most people in the U.S. identify as being Christian, but only half of those people attend church on a regular basis. The second most popular religion is Judaism. The third most common religion in the U.S. is Islam. Other religions practiced in the U.S. include Hinduism and Buddhism. About 20% of all people in the U.S. say they don't practice any religion. One of the founding principles of the United States is a religious freedom which means people can practice whatever religion they want without being discriminated against. This is even guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution. This is one reason why the United States has no official religion. Because there are so many different religions in the United States, there are many different types of houses of worship. Christians attend churches. Jews and Hindus attend temples. Muslims attend mosques. Many people use what they wear to reflect their religious beliefs. For example, some Islamic women wear a scarf called hijab to cover their head. It is disrespectful to ask a Muslim woman to take off her hijab or ask for her to show you what is under it. Male followers of an Indian religion called Sikhism usually wear cotton turbans. Again, it is wrong to take a person's turban off or ask that they take it off. Male followers of Hasidism, a branch of Judaism, have long curls on the side of their heads. They wear a fringed prayer shawl. Other Jewish men may wear a small cap on their heads called a yarmulke. This is supposed to be a constant reminder that God is above them. One of the most recent social changes taking place in the United States and in the world is social networking. Social networking in itself is not a new development. These types of groups have been in existence for at least 150 years, and probably longer than that. In the times before the invention of the personal computer and the advent of the World Wide Web, social networking was done in person. People who had similar likes and interests would gather together to share experiences, make new contacts, and promote themselves or their businesses. On the internet, social networking websites made their first appearances during the late 1990s. The first major social networking website in the United States was MySpace. MySpace was a comprehensive social networking site that allowed its users to exchange messages, share pictures, and make new friends in a way that was never thought of in the past. With MySpace, people who did not go out much could reach out to others from the comfort of their own homes. In 2004, Facebook was created. It was originally a website created for use by Harvard University students, graduates, and faculty, but it soon expanded to include just about everyone. Facebook is an elaborate social networking site that has grown incredibly fast. It is now larger than some of the largest companies in the world. It is a website that is in constant change. New features are added regularly. Facebook has revolutionized the way people stay connected with each other and the rest of the world. The way it works is simple. Users can set up a new account easily. All a new user needs is an email address to start. Once a person has created an account, he or she can invite friends by sending a request out to people they know who also have their own Facebook pages. Once you get started, making new friends will come easily. There can be different kinds of entertainment at a wedding reception. Usually there will be a master of ceremonies, or MC, who helps move the reception along by making announcements of what will happen next. For example, the MC will announce when the newly married couple enters the reception hall, and all the guests will stand up and applaud. A wedding reception usually has music and guests are expected to dance. The music can be provided by a DJ or by a live band. Sometimes the DJ or a live band will accept requests from guests to play a certain song.
When the newly married couple enters the reception, they will share a dance by themselves to a song they picked beforehand. Usually, the song is something romantic and represents the couple's love for one another. Sometimes the bride will share a dance with her father and the groom will share a dance with his mother. After these special dances, the guests are invited to the dance floor. Food at a wedding reception can be buffet style, where everyone serves himself or herself, or it can be a sit-down meal served by waiters. Guests get to choose among a meat, chicken, or fish deal. Guests generally make their choices when they respond to the initial wedding invitations. During a wedding, guests shouldn't expect to spend too much time with the bride and groom. The new couple is usually very busy greeting all of their guests. Sometimes the couple doesn't even get a chance to eat. What almost every newly married couple does get to eat at their wedding reception is the wedding cake. The bride and groom traditionally cut through the wedding cake together and then feed the other person a bite. There are many traditions that U.S. brides and grooms are expected to follow at their wedding. One of the most well-known traditions is for a bride to toss her bridal bouquet to the unmarried female guests attending her reception. According to the tradition, the single woman who catches the bouquet will be the next woman to be married. The flowers thrown may not be actually the same flowers the bride carries down the aisle during the wedding ceremony. An identical bouquet is created for the bride to toss. This is because many times the bride wants to keep her original bouquet as a remembrance. Many women take the flower toss very seriously. There have been videos documenting how women will sometimes even fight each other for the bridal bouquet. The groom has something to toss at the wedding reception, too. One tradition is the groom takes a garter from his new wife's leg and toss the garter to the unmarried men attending the reception. According to the tradition, the single man who catches the garter will be the next man to get married. Sometimes the groom will remove the garter from his wife's leg with his teeth. At some wedding receptions, the man who catches the garter has to place it on the leg of the woman who catches the bridal bouquet. Some people think this is too sexual, and to just skip this part, it is the decision of the bride and groom. The bride and groom often toast each other with champagne before the end of the reception. Sometimes a bride and groom will leave the reception before it is over. They go right to the airport to begin their honeymoon, a special vacation celebrating their new life together. The stereotype is that Americans are lazy, but studies show that people in the U.S. get less vacation time than people in other parts of the world. A typical American worker gets two or three weeks off out of a whole year for vacation. Most U.S. workers cannot take those two or three weeks consecutively. They usually have to be spread out throughout the year. Even when U.S. workers are on vacation, they are often expected to be in communication with their boss. This means checking in via email and mobile phone. Most U.S. businesses do not encourage their employees to take all the vacation days they are entitled to. In fact, most U.S. companies discourage it. Other countries, especially countries in Europe, have much more vacation time. In Germany, many people have six weeks of paid vacation. At least three of these weeks can be taken consecutively. Maybe this is why Europeans and other travelers vacation in far-off exotic places. Most American families tend to stay closer to home, rarely leaving the country. The difference in the amount of vacation time is legal. Most companies in countries outside the U.S. have to give paid time off to their employees or else pay hefty fines. However, in the U.S., there is no federal law requiring employers to give workers paid vacation. In fact, the U.S. is the only developed country that doesn't guarantee yearly time off to workers. There have been efforts to pass laws giving U.S. workers one week of paid vacation by law, but so far, those efforts have not been successful. Even when U.S. workers do have time off, many are afraid to take it because they worry they may be seen as non-productive workers and lose their job. Other workers worry about going on vacation and having a mountain of work when they return. 
Camping is a popular way for many people in the United States to spend their vacation. Camping involves people leaving the comfort of their home and driving to spend a few nights or more in the great outdoors. When people camp, they can sleep in a tent, a camper, or if they want to be fancier, they can sleep in a cabin. Some people like to really rough it and use no shelter except for a sleeping bag and sleep under the stars. Some people drive across the U.S. in what is known as a recreational vehicle or RV, which is a trailer. Inside, there are beds, a tiny bathroom, and a kitchen. There are campgrounds all over the United States. These are places where campers gather together and usually pay a fee to pitch a tent or place a camper in a designated outdoor spot. Many of these campgrounds have water hoses and electric hookups so that people can wash dishes and themselves and plug in a radio or their computers. Most campsites also have a fire ring or pit, which is a hole in the ground where people can safely make a fire for roasting marshmallows, a popular camping activity. There usually is also a picnic table for people to eat their meals. Many of these campgrounds also have shared bathrooms complete with showers. Some campgrounds have playgrounds, pools, and game rooms. Some also organize activities for people who like sing-alongs, where people will gather together and sing songs. Usually it is illegal to camp in a place not designated as an official campsite, meaning you can't just pitch a tent in a forest. When people go camping, they often do other outdoor activities like fishing, canoeing, hiking, kayaking, swimming, horseback riding, and mountain biking. When you rent an apartment, you need to check the lease for rules and responsibilities. For example, some landlords do not want you to have guests spend the night. This is because the landlord doesn't know who your guests are. If they damage the apartment in any way, you will be responsible. Also, sometimes a friend who wants to crash on your couch ends up staying for a really long time and ends up becoming another tenant. You are responsible for all the utilities you use while living in a rental apartment. This means you will have to pay for the electricity and gas you use. If the landlord pays for any utilities, it will say so in the lease. Once you move in, you will have to call the electric company and the gas company so they can put accounts in your name. Also, if you want a phone line, cable, or internet, you will have to call those companies and pay for those services yourself unless the lease says that is included in your rent. Your landlord is supposed to have access to the apartment you are renting from them. This doesn't mean they can just barge in whenever. It does mean, though, that with notice, the landlord is allowed to come into the apartment during a reasonable time, meaning not in the middle of the night when you are sleeping. During this time, the landlord will inspect the apartment to make sure you are following the rules, and the landlord can also make any necessary repairs. All of this should be written out on the lease. If it is not, do not be afraid to ask the landlord to add that information. It protects both the landlord and you. If you have a low income, are elderly, or are disabled, there are a number of public housing options in the United States. Public housing options are run by the federal, state, and city government agencies. Living in public housing is often called living in the projects, but this is a negative term based on stereotypes. Not all public housing options mean living in huge, rundown buildings with lots of crime. Public housing programs come in all sizes and types. One type is a single-family house, another type includes living in a high-rise building or apartments in tall buildings. All public housing options are rental options, meaning you do not own the place where you live. Eligibility for public housing is based on a number of factors. One factor is your annual gross income, meaning how much money you make in a year. Another factor is if you are elderly or have a disability. Another factor taken into consideration is your U.S. citizenship or eligible immigration status. Most public housing options are only available to U.S. citizens or U.S. legal residents. Like with any rental, your references are checked to make sure you and your family will be good tenants. This means looking at your credit history and your criminal record. People with criminal records are usually banned or not allowed to use public housing options. To find out if you are eligible for public housing, you need to visit a government housing assistance office close to you. 
You can find your local housing assistance office by checking the yellow pages or by looking online. You will have to fill out an application. On the application, you will need to list the names, gender, and date of birth of all people who would be living in the house or apartment. America is known as the land of opportunity, where one could achieve anything they put their mind to, no matter who they are. Thousands of people immigrate to the United States every year from different parts of the world to have access to these kinds of opportunities. This is what is known as the American dream. One of the many reasons America is such a great country is the diversity you see all around. America is one big melting pot of citizens from different backgrounds. America is also home to many of the world's top colleges and universities. The California Institute of Technology is a top world-ranked college that focuses highly on science and engineering. It is located in the city of Pasadena. Harvard University is another top world-ranked college that you might be familiar with. The buildings at Harvard date all the way back to the year 1636, making Harvard the oldest university in the United States. It is located in the state of Massachusetts. University of California, Los Angeles is another institute worthy of recognition. Located next to Hollywood, UCLA has distinguished itself as a prestigious and selective university due to the number of people who apply for admission throughout the United States. The universities mentioned are but a few of the many other excellent schools that make the United States so outstanding. America is also known for being at the forefront of freedom and equality. Although our history may be contradictory to these ideals, we have progressed and now live in a land of equal opportunity. Whether you wish to become a doctor, a lawyer, or a librarian, America is the best place to be at to achieve these dreams. The 4th of July is the United States' celebration of its independence from England. It is the day when the Declaration of Independence was adopted by the new country's forefathers and is a national holiday. It has been celebrated every year since 1776. Americans hold this day as one of the most revered holidays in the country. Independence Day celebrations include fireworks shows that are held by various organizations throughout the country. The shows are held at stadiums, recreational parks, and private homes. Additionally, many businesses have giveaways and special discounts for all residents on this day. The fireworks shows are best at stadiums, where they attract a large number of people. This is a recent change in the way Americans celebrate the day. In the past, most people bought their own fireworks from vendors who sell their goods in supermarket parking lots. The reason many cities no longer allow the sales or use of fireworks is because of the fire hazards they pose. This is why the large professional celebrations stadiums and parks have become popular in recent years. Of course, many people still celebrate at home, though. There are some cities where sales and use of fireworks are still legal, and many Americans take full advantage of this. Another Fourth of July tradition is the backyard barbecue, the holiday occurs in the middle of summer, and Americans love to grill outdoors to avoid the heat inside the house. Hamburgers and hot dogs are the food of choice, but steaks are also prepared often. There is nothing better than a great American meal and a cold drink celebrating the 4th of July. It is a popular holiday, and it is one that has great meaning to most Americans. The United States government is composed of three major sections. It is based on the Constitution of the United States of America that was put into effect in May 1789. And the three parts of the U.S. government are the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Each branch works independently of the other two, and each has its own responsibilities. This system is in place to ensure that no branch can carry more power than the other. This is called the separation of powers, which was written into the Constitution. The executive branch is the branch that most Americans are familiar with. It includes the President of the United States, the Vice President, and the Cabinet. The President is the leader of the country and is the Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. military. 
The vice president is second in command and will act as president if the president dies, resigns, or is removed from office. The cabinet acts as agents of the U.S. president and carry out the duties they are entrusted with. The legislative branch of government consists of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Together, they form the Congress, which can levy and collect taxes, mint money, and establish federal courts. It can also declare war and raise and support the Army, Navy, and Air Force to protect the country. The House of Representatives has 435 members, and the Senate consists of 100 senators, with two from each of the states. Any legislation or new law must be approved by both the House of Representatives and the Senate. The judicial branch is entrusted to apply the laws created by the legislative branch of government. It has the power to create lower courts under the Supreme Court of the United States. It works closely with state courts, although they are separate. Christmas observed on December 25th is a Christian holiday that celebrates the birth of Jesus Christ. Christians of different denominations go to church on Christmas. Many Catholics go to Midnight Mass. In the United States, however, the holiday has a much more secular tone and is celebrated throughout the country. Many people, regardless of their religion, put up and decorate a Christmas tree. The tree can be a real evergreen or it can be an artificial tree. Lights, strings, tinsel, and even popcorn can be used to decorate a Christmas tree. On the top of the tree is a star or an angel. The decorations are usually red and green. The purpose of a Christmas tree is to have a central location to place gifts. According to legend, a jolly fat man with a beard named Santa Claus leaves presents under the tree. Children in the U.S. often write lists of things they want Santa to bring them. Many parents bring their children to shopping malls across the country to tell a man dressed as Santa what they want. These children are often also photographed with the mall Santa as a keepsake. On Christmas Eve, many children leave milk and cookies for Santa. Of course, it is the parents that buy the gifts from the wish lists and even eat the cookies and drink the milk. On Christmas Day, children usually wake up early and run to the tree so they can see what Santa brought them. Adults can also exchange gifts at this time. People don't just decorate a tree at Christmas. Many also elaborately decorate their homes with lights. Some of the displays are even synchronized to Christmas songs called carols. Originally, these songs were religious, but now they are about the spirit of the season. New Year's Day officially begins as soon as people yell, Happy New Year! at midnight. Most people continue partying well after midnight into the wee hours of the first day of the new year. In fact, many New Year's parties include breakfast or brunch. Sometimes, at the stroke of midnight, there will be fireworks, and couples often kiss. One of the most famous New Year's celebrations takes place in New York City's Times Square, where a huge cut crystal ball drops at midnight in front of millions of people standing in the cold. Many more millions watch on television. Some groups, called polar bear clubs, jump into the cold ocean water on New Year's Day as a literal way to start the New Year fresh. New Year's Day, January 1st, is a national holiday in the United States. This means that schools, banks, government offices, and post offices are closed. Given how much people tend to drink alcohol on New Year's Eve, many people wake up on New Year's Day with a hangover. The national holiday is a good day to recover. Many people go out partying with their friends on New Year's Eve. Many people use New Year's Day to visit family members. New Year's Day is also when many people start on their New Year's resolutions. A resolution is a promise to change a lifestyle habit. The most common resolution is to lose weight. Many people also join gyms as part of their resolutions. On New Year's Day, there are also parades, such as the famous Tournament of Roses Parade in Pasadena, California, where all the floats are made of different colored roses and they compete for awards. Many people also watch college and professional football games, including the Rose Bowl, which is also held in Pasadena, California. The third Monday in January is an American federal holiday, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It falls near the birthday of the civil rights leader, who was assassinated in 1968. 
King, a minister, became known for non-violently protesting the treatment of African Americans in the United States and laws that discriminated against blacks. Specifically, King protested segregation that separated blacks and whites in public restrooms, public pools, public schools, on buses, and at restaurants. King led many marches in the United States, especially in the South, where segregation was especially practiced and enforced. And in Washington, D.C., his march on Washington, D.C. was perhaps his most famous one, where he gave the I Have a Dream speech. On Martin Luther King Jr. Day, federal, state, and local offices are closed, including public schools and post offices. On the holiday, many people participate in marches and vigils remembering Dr. King. Others use the day as a day of service and volunteer in their community by cleaning up garbage in a local park or serving food to the homeless. However, the holiday was controversial. Some states didn't want to honor Dr. King and tried to rename the holiday or combine the day with another holiday. Only two other people have a U.S. national holiday, Christopher Columbus and George Washington. Martin Luther King Jr. Day became a holiday in 1983 after pressure from civil rights activists and marches, similar to the ones King used to lead. Efforts to create a King holiday began the same year King was killed. The first state to recognize King Day as a holiday was Illinois. The last state to recognize the holiday was Arizona.